Oh man, I'm dizzy as hell. Oh. Everything's spinning. Space medicine is pretty cool. I've talked about it on the channel quite a lot, but how do you actually test what happens in zero gravity? Well, do experiments on the International Space Station, of course, yes, but A, there are only ever a few astronauts up there at a time, they've got tons of other stuff to do, so it's highly unlikely your experiment will get chosen. B, if your experiment does get chosen, you don't want to waste all that precious astronaut time doing the preliminary stuff. You want all the prep done, you want to know whatever you're testing is feasible, and most importantly, C, I won't get to do any of that because, surprise, surprise, my application to become an ESA astronaut never got off the launch pad. Yes, for some reason, me writing a 16-page manifesto about my social media clout and the promise to reenact the Dr. Manhattan meme in space failed to impress the astronaut selection committee that only chooses a few super dedicated, utterly exceptional people less than once a decade their loss. But another department of the European Space Agency did get in touch with me. A better department, let's be honest. And they asked if I wanted to do a weightlessness flight. I said, eh, I don't know. I mean, any old science fluencer does them these days. And they said, no, 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 this isn't some commercial fun flight just for laughs. This is a flying laboratory with real science being done that I can take part in. And I said, Okay, I do hate frivolity, and I like my science to be completely serious, but this still seems so run-of-the-mill. So they said, we'll give you two flights instead of one, and I was like, yeah, maybe, you know, sweeten the deal a bit. And they said, you'll be weightless for a total of 23 minutes. That's more than Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Derek, and Simone put together. And I said, you son of a bitch, I'm in. Obviously, that isn't quite how it went. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. If you want to see loads of extra footage from this trip, head on over to Nebula now, where you'll find an extended cut with this much time added on to the end of this video. To understand the physics of parabolic flights, you should watch those people that I cheekily mentioned just now, because they've made some fantastic videos that explain many aspects of weightlessness training. So instead, what I'm going to concentrate on today is the biomedical science that's done on board, because to reiterate, many vomit comets, as they're often known, are commercial operations that anybody can just pay for and, and fly on. They tend to do maybe 15 or so parabole, each of which gives you about 22 to 25 seconds of weightlessness. Whereas the Novaspas Airbus 310 that I went on is first and foremost a science campaign with one, just one, spot for a media person. In fact, even though the US has a few companies operating these kinds of flights, this is the real deal from a science perspective. So a team from NASA came all the way to France just to use this plane. And they even used my neck in their study. More on that later. The day before the first flight, we had our orientation and checks. plane's old enough to have uh, old proper controls. It's not um, fly-by-wire computer stopping you from doing these kind of stupid things, but still you're very young in terms of flight hours because it's not like a commercial plane that's been all over the place. Um, so it's a really good candidate for this. Well, I've just had my pre-test checks for the jugular flow study, and uh, apparently my jugular is juicy, so they're gonna uh, take me in the study, very nice, and uh, that happens tomorrow. All of our times, there is one thing that has nourished our soul. YouTuber. And elevated our species above its origins. 
and that is our curry. The dreams of an entire planet are focused tonight on those 14 brave souls traveling into the heavens. That man sounds... YouTuber. That's your daddy. And may we all, citizens the world over, see these events through. Godspeed and good luck to you. <laughs> So I'm. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, we are on the parabolic flight, on the way up, yet to make the first parabola, and I'm sitting next to Neil Melville, who is the director of parabolic flights at ESA. Is that right? He's yep. a parabolic flight coordinator. Coordinator. Yeah. Neil, I think you've described it before as a flying laboratory. Yeah, it's a. It really is a flying laboratory, and it's really quite unique because there are so many different types of experiments that are on board in this very small space and different teams from all over Europe investigating loads of really different things. On board for this campaign, we had a whole bunch of physics experiments, which were fascinating, but you don't really want me attempting to explain them in any detail. I can tell you that we had experiments about novel ways to safely deorbit satellites instead of you know, blasting them out of the sky like the Russian government recently did, one about attitude correction for tiny femto satellites, one about heat transfer and zero gravity because you don't have the usual convection currents, and one about the Janibekov effect. And if you don't know what the Janibekov effect is, I mean, frankly, I don't know what to tell you. No, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. So really loads of different stuff on board and also a few biomedical experiments. Right, and let's hear a bit more about them. Now, I will get to the science in a moment, but first of all, I had to twat about a bit. I know it's hard for you lay people to tell, but not all of this is aimless twattery. Some is high level content generating twattery as I was trying to do CPR in space because of my tendency to cause in-air medical emergencies that's going to be a video on its own. Make sure you're subscribed because that's coming soon. But let's concentrate on the proper scientists for now. A team from St. Mary's University in London were testing an innovative sled, which reproduces the act of jumping without relying on gravity. As you might already know, or indeed remember from my previous videos, one of the biggest problems in microgravity is the loss of bone density, which could be catastrophic on a long journey such as going to Mars. Plyometrics, or jumping, is a fantastic way to stimulate bone growth, which is why basketball and squash players have some of the highest bone density. Indeed, I used to be a pretty serious sprinter, and my favourite part of training was plyo, and even in my advanced years, I still like to do it now and again. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to try the sled out, not least because I was busy offering my beautiful neck veins to NASA. Well, when I wasn't doing this. Or this. Or this. Or this. The second biomedical experiment was a biggie. I'm Dr. Karina Marshall Goble. I am a senior scientist with KBR in the NASA Johnson Space Center Cardiovascular and Vision Laboratory. We're investigating the cerebral venous outflow dynamics uh, during weightlessness. So we're going to be looking at the internal jugular veins the brachiocephalic veins, um, and the blood flow dynamics that occur both in 1G and 0G. I know you also do some work regarding nerves and eyes and things, uh, but they're pretty boring, so let's concentrate on, <laughs> on the vascular stuff. Because you, you do something very unusual for uh, research in this field in that you want a lot of mainstream media headlines with a study you published a couple of years ago. Tell us about, a bit about what that shows. Sure, so we did a, stu a study on the International Space Station with crew members undergoing long duration space flight. So anywhere from four to nine months on the International Space Station. And we looked at the cerebral venous outflow, looking at the internal jugular veins, uh, but mostly with the interest of understanding the outflow of the blood flow from the eyes. We had very interesting findings. We had one crew member that actually had a blood clot in their left internal jugular vein and about half of the subjects had very abnormal blood flow in the jugular vein. Uh, we saw flow stasis, so no flow at all. We saw reverse flow with it was going in the wrong direction. And this was very surprising, incidental findings. So what we're doing today is we are going to be looking at the blood flow findings um, on parabolic flight. We want to understand the time course better because the first time we looked at blood flow in space flight was on flight day 45. So we don't know if this is something that takes a lot of time to develop or if it happens immediately upon exposure to weightlessness. So understanding that time course will help us understand the risk. Is it a risk for very short missions, suborbital flights, 
commercial tourism, uh, flights to the moon, or is it really just a risk for Mars and long duration space flight? That's uh, big implications because potentially having a clot in such an important vein could be catastrophic on any kind of flight. Absolutely. And it's never something that you want to hear, uh, somebody having a blood clot, especially when they are thousands of miles away from Earth um, in standard medical care. Now, I was in the slightly unusual position of being a test subject, but also being able to do and interpret these scans. So obviously, I couldn't help but look at my results. However, I promised Karina that I wouldn't divulge anything, so I can't wait for the paper to be published because I think the results are going to be amazing. We did have a bit of a laugh because the physiologist from NASA that scanned my neck completed the data set uh, very quickly, but then had a mid-air rendezvous with their sick bag. So we joked that it would be useful for all test subjects to be able to finish the study themselves. But let's not stop the ultrasound fun there. The nice people at Philips loaned me their swanky Lumify ultrasound doofer, which plugs straight into your phone. So I scanned my heart in zero gravity. I mean, did you really expect anything different from me? Now this sequence was cut shorter than planned. Ideally, I wanted to measure blood flow out of the heart in hyper and zero gravity and compare the two. The only window or angle that I can see my heart nicely when scanning myself is here, subcostally, right underneath the solar plexus. There are other windows um, in different parts of the rib cage, but I just don't get a good picture when I'm scanning myself because of the position you need to be in. Plus, I don't think anybody on the plane really wanted to see me topless. Okay, so, so I'm ably assisted by Lars here. What I'm going to try and do is uh, scan my heart in hyper and zero gravity and see if we can spot any differences. Um, this is a, a little Philips device that uh, they've kindly lent me. However, having just been spun really rapidly, I'm not, I'm not feeling that great. So I'm, I'm not sure that pushing on my stomach is really the best idea, but let's give it a try. So I, if I have to kind of hold my breath a bit to bring the heart down, this is a subcostal view. You can see the left ventricle and right ventricle pumping there and the both atria. If you're only feeling mildly queasy with this footage, that's testament to Sebastian's incredible camera work while being thrown around an aeroplane. Okay, hypergravity. I doubt I'd even have kept myself pointing in the same direction leave aside a camera. With the eye of faith, I think you can see less blood returning to the heart from the body in hypergravity, which makes sense because it's being pooled in the legs. 40. In zero gravity, the amount of blood the heart pumps with each beat goes up initially within a few seconds as fluid redistributes in the upper body but extended periods in space are not good for your heart as it becomes weaker and actually changes shape. Right. So that is my heart 30. in zero gravity. Nice. The flight doctor assessed all of us the day before flying and when I reported to him that I never really get motion sickness, he gave me a tiny dose of the anti-sickness injection. After all, homeopathy is very popular in France, and I was absolutely fine. So the following day for the second flight, I got cocky. I went full anti-vax. This dodgy doctor is always trying to make you take drugs. I said, mais non, doctor, je n'ai pas besoin de ton spécial médecine pour les bébés. And I went without. On the plane, flying up at this point, feeling a bit like Top Gun, I got chatting to the Novospass crew who've done hundreds of these flights, and I bragged about my anti-jab stance. And they just looked at me and said they always get an injection. Interestingly, it's not the zero gravity that makes you sick, it's the hypergravity. And sticking that ultrasound probe right in my tummy under the solar plexus meant I had to sit out a few parabolae looking distinctively green. Uh, it was not what the doctor ordered. I'll do, I'll do it on the next one. I'll do it on the next one. This was one of the most amazing things I've ever done and a real dream come true. Thank you, Neil, and everybody at ESA and Novospass who made it happen. It had been postponed so many times with the pandemic, I'd almost accepted it was never going to go ahead. One slight shame is that I was originally scheduled to go on a flight that simulated Martian and lunar gravity as well as zero gravity. And I had a plan to break dance, maybe become the first person to break dance in Martian gravity. Zero gravity isn't really conducive to dancing, but 
I wasn't going to let that stop me trying. And those would have been ideal to do some breakdancing in uh, partial gravity. I suspect this isn't going to work. It's my last parabola in the free floating area. So I'm going to try and do some windmills, which I haven't done for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was a success, but uh, it went about as well as I expected. Another graceful and elegant landing. Don't forget to watch out for my CPR in space video soon. As you can imagine, I had a ton more footage from this trip that I wanted to share, so I've put a bunch of extras into an extended cut over on Nebula. Instead of this ad read, the video over there continues. Nebula is a streaming platform that I co-founded and it features some of my buddies that just happen to be the best educational creators around. It's where we can put edgy or lengthy or experimental stuff without worrying about algorithms or YouTube changing something. And you can find not only extended cuts like this video, but also exclusive originals like Joe Scott's Mystery of Aging. We've partnered up with Curiosity Stream to offer you an amazing deal right now. Curiosity Stream loves supporting educational content, and they've been a massive reason that I've managed to keep this channel going. You'll find thousands of documentaries where you can learn about the future of lunar exploration, transhumanism, or the story of the James Webb Telescope. By clicking the link below, and using my code MEDLIFE, you can get 26% off the usual price for an annual subscription to Curiosity Stream, and you'll get a subscription to Nebula included. That's access to both for less than $15 for the whole year. This is honestly the best deal in streaming. Clicking that link or visiting curiositystream.com forward slash MEDLIFE is one of the best things that you can do to support my channel, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, you space cadets. Thank you.